Just give a few more minutes just to see, uh, give people a chance to join. I've only just uh, posted the link in the Facebook group. So uh, I've got a couple of requests already. I've got this uh, question here uh, and then a request for growth and decay in reducing balance questions. Yes, can definitely go through that. I'm just going to steal. I think we did one of these yesterday. Let me just... Yeah, this one. I'll grab that one again. Go through one again. All right. Uh, fitting the line of best fit. That's a good one as well. We can definitely do that. We'll have a have a talk about it because I think we might need to clear something up. Yeah, regression line was what I was going to mention because line of best fit is kind of a, a older way uh, that we used to kind of do in uh, maths A where um, you would just kind of use your eye to kind of draw a line through the dots that kind of looked about right, where you sort of had even dots on each side, and you would call it line of best fit, fitting it by eye. Um, we don't do that in the new syllabus. Uh, I have never seen a question that the QCAA has put out where they ask you to draw it in by eye. When they say to fit a least squares regression line, uh, you have to put it into your calculator and you get the equation of the line. So we will definitely do one of those as well. So I'm just going to find a question while people are joining. Um, we'll do that. I think there's a good one in the QCAA sample. All right, I'm just putting some questions together um, that people have requested and then we'll get started. Yeah, we can definitely talk time zones as well today. <laughs> Apparently my number one fan is here, that's exciting. Uh, alrighty. Okay, let's get started. So, of my requests, one of the first requests I had was this one. This is from the Pearson textbook. Um, now, I don't love it as a question because it's actually not, uh, it's not a valid way of uh, getting an accurate answer, um, this method that they're proposing so yeah i don't i don't love it um but it you know conceivably could be a complex unfamiliar question so let's basically give it a go okay so i'm just going to do a and then i can maybe leave you guys to give b a go uh in your own time uh but essentially what they're trying to show is that one of these places if i sort of draw a bit of a diagram we've got Mossman here, like this, and Normanton would be sort of here-ish, like this, okay? So you've sort of got this line of latitude, 
this line of latitude. So Mossman's latitude is 16 degrees and 27 minutes south. And Normanton's is 17 degrees and 40 minutes south. Now, the reason I know that Normanton is below Mossman is because uh, it's more south, if that makes sense. So it must be below uh, Mossman. Normanton must be below Mossman. Okay. And then if I draw in my longitude, uh, Mossman's is. 140, nope, five. And uh, Normanton must be to, to the left of Mossman because it is less east, if that makes sense. Less east is the same as more west. Okay, so what they're sort of trying to get you to do there is if you want to find the difference between these two and you assume that these are right angles, you can basically use Pythagoras to find the difference between them. So you'd have to find the distance between, uh, so from here to here, you would do with, um, um, that's the same line of latitude, so that would be this uh, 111.2 cos theta times the angular distance. So you'd do that there. And then from here to here, you would uh, do the 111.2 uh, times the angular distance because that's the same line of longitude. And then once you have those two different distances, you can then, you know, do Pythagoras' theorem, which is c squared equals a squared plus b squared to figure out what sort of this distance here is c, okay? Now, uh, it is not a valid solution. It's not an accurate solution because as it says in the question, uh, it says the parallels of latitude forming right angles with meridians. They don't. That, so that's a, not a correct assumption, so it's not going to be an accurate answer. It will get you close to an answer, but it's not fully accurate. So I think that's what they're going with when they say explain any assumptions you have made. So you're assuming that it forms a right angle triangle. Uh, you're assuming that the lines of latitude and longitude are at right angles with each other. So you're making a lot of assumptions there and they're not necessarily accurate assumptions. So yeah, so that's basically what you can do. Uh, so for that um, distance, if we call this, let's call this A and call this B, for distance A, you would would type in uh, 111.2 cos and then the latitude is 17 degrees and 40 minutes and then you would multiply the angular distance and you would have to subtract those two. So you would do 145, I'm doing this in my calculator right now, 145 degrees and 22 minutes take away 141 degrees and five actually probably could have done that without my calculator but oh well it's uh very tiring so that's four degrees and 17 minutes. So you pop all that into your calculator. And I get a distance of 453. Uh, let's just do two decimal places. 
So that's my first distance there. And then for distance B, I would do 111.2 times, and then the angular distance would also be done through subtraction because they are in the same hemisphere. Okay. Four hundred and fifty three point eight four squared plus one hundred and thirty five point two nine squared. Uh, now, do remember that uh, um, Pythagoras, I believe, was in. Uh, year 11 content so technically you know everything in year 11 is considered assumed knowledge so they can draw upon it so i got a distance of 204.87 kilometers for the distance between those two points so that's not an accurate way of doing it but by making some assumptions you can approach an answer okay so that's that one that'll probably, if you want to have a go at B, feel free to do so in your own time. Okay. But, you know, that's kind of an idea of maybe a complex, unfamiliar question. Maybe. Who knows? No one knows. Except for a few people who wrote the test. Okay. So my next request was for um, reducing balance loans through recursion growth and decay stuff. So um, so growth and decay, basically growth just means the numbers are increasing and decay means that the numbers are decreasing. So in a reducing balance loan where you've borrowed a set amount of money and you're paying it off, then that's always going to be decay because the numbers will go down as long as you keep making those repayments, okay? So uh, reducing balance loan is an example of decay. So I'll just write that down. Whereas maybe if you were in the deposit phase of a annuity, then that would be growth, okay? Now, is it geometric or is it arithmetic? Well, it's kind of both because when you think about it, here's the recursion relation. It would be R times the current term minus a common difference. So you can see there's a common ratio there and there's a common difference. So it's kind of a combination of both arithmetic and geometric, okay? Uh, so the question I have here in front of you is the one and only example of question that the QCAA has put out that involves recursion in the um, reducing balance loan or annuities context. Uh, so uh, it's probably worth our while going through this one. Um, Right. Uh, so this one's quite easy. Uh, your recursive relation is recurrence relation, sorry. Okay, so what this is showing is the R, which you can see here, the common ratio is representing the interest that's being added to the loan. OK, so the one would represent sort of 100 percent the actual amount. And so this section here represents the percentage it's increasing by. OK, so that's your interest rate there uh, symbolized. OK, 
Uh, so let's say, what does it say? Is it monthly? Yes, it is monthly. Okay. So if I do 0 0.0243 times 12, that would be, uh, and then times 100 to turn it into a uh, percentage, that equates to 29.16%. So that must have been the original interest rate, okay? which is quite bad. Do not accept an interest rate that high. That is enormous, okay? Now, so that's the common ratio. The common difference here represents the uh, payment that's being made, okay? So that's where the decay comes in, okay? Because the if you just had the interest rate, that would make growth, but because you're paying it off, it's decay. The numbers are going down. So that means you're paying off $60 every month. Now, I believe on the um, formula sheet, they represent it with a capital R, uh, but they all mean the same thing, okay? Uh, D is common difference. R, I think, stands for repayment, okay? So that's what those values are, okay? So if we uh, go ahead and do this question, uh, we just need to use recursion basically. So we want after two months. So A0 is the starting value, which is $350. So A1 would then be the balance after one month. So you would do 1.0243 times 350, uh, take away 60, okay? Which would give you, uh, you can obviously do this much quicker. Uh, you don't have to show all the working out in a multiple choice question, but I'm obviously trying to teach people how to do it. So I'm going to do the whole steps. So A1 equals $298.505. So the balance after two months would then carry that number down. So that's what recurrence kind of means, a repeated calculation. So you take your answer from the previous calculation and you repeat it again. And you get $245.76, which is option C. Lovely. So if I were to give you an example, maybe you could turn it into a recurrence relation. Okay, so let's say there's a loan of $25,000. Uh, interest, let's do 9.6%. Let's do compounding, uh, let's do compounding monthly. And let's say that there's repayments. That's not how you spell it. Let's make the repayments, uh, I don't know, 250, doesn't really matter, okay? So what I want you guys to do is write that as a recurrence relation uh, using that same formula as above. Similar, obviously, that's going to be different with different values. And then find the balance at the end of three months. Have a go at that. And then I'll show you the answer.
Um, so I've got a question. When do you take one away from the interest? In this case, we're doing it the other way. We're creating the recurrence relation. So you're going to need to add one to the interest rate. So I'll start you off on this bit. So the R is going to be one plus the interest rate, and that's interest as a decimal per compounding period. Okay. So because we're doing this in the other direction, in the previous question, they gave us a recurrence relation. So that's why I was able to uh, put it back to its original form. In this case, I'm giving you the variables and you have to make the recurrence relation. So we're doing the opposite. So why do I know to add one? Well, if you want to uh, increase, let's say it was a, dis this is a totally side topic, but it will be make it easier to understand. If you have, say, a markup, do you remember this from year 11? If you want to mark something up uh, by 20%, what you could do is you could get your, let's say it's a $50 jacket, you would multiply that by 20%, uh, which would give you $10. And then you could add that on, which would give you $60. Okay, you've increased it by 20%. If you want to do that in one go, one step, you would multiply it by 1.2%. You have increased it by 20% because one would be 100%, which is 50. So 1.2 is 20% on top of 50. Okay. So that's how you increase something by a percentage, okay? So by adding one, I am increasing it by the interest rate. If I didn't do that, I would end up decreasing it because multiplying by a number less than one would decrease it. Okay, so I'm just going to rub that out so I don't confuse people. But that's how you increase by a percentage. So my R value is going to be 1 plus 0 0.096 divided by 12 because it's monthly, okay, which is 1.008, I believe. So that's going to be my R value. Uh, so if you wanted to decrease by a percentage, you would take that percentage away from one. If you wanted to increase, you would add one. So my full recurrence relation would be and then take away the repayment like that, okay? That's my recurrence relation. So that's increasing by the interest rate and then taking away the uh, repayment, okay? So if you wanna increase by a percentage, you add it to one. If you wanna decrease by a percentage, you take it away from one, okay? That'll increase and decrease by a percentage. Okay, so a zero would then be 25,000. A one would be 25,000, oopsie, sorry. 1.008 times 25,000 take away 250. Yeah, so reducing balance will always decrease unless you stop making your payments. That's why reducing means to go down. So it's always going to be decay. The only time it wouldn't be is if you stop making your payments and then that's a whole problem in and of itself. You do not want to stop making your payments on a loan. The bank gets angry. <laughs> Can we have an example with a one takeaway, please? 
Uh, yeah, I think I can find you something on the QCAA sample. I think I have something in mind. Let's finish this question. How do we go with that question? Did you kind of get there in the end, hopefully? All right. I'm just going to blank my screen for a second while I find that question I was thinking of. Um, there we go. Okay, here's the one I was thinking of. So, have a read of this question. This is from the sample, the public sample paper, I believe, paper one. Have a read of that one. And part A might trick you up a little bit. Yeah, lots of questions about uh, arithmetic and geometric sequences. Okay, so this one you can tell is a geometric sequence. You can tell that because it's being multiplied. That must be an R. If it's multiply, you know it's geometric. If it's adding or subtracting, you know it's arithmetic. Okay, so since it's multiply, it must be geometric. Now, part A there asks, Calculate the percentage by which each term decreases. Now, you might be tempted to put 65% uh, because 0 0.65 as a percentage would be 65%. But you would be wrong because you're not decreasing it by 65%. Okay. It would be 100% take away. 35% leaves you with 65%. Okay? So it's actually a decrease of 35%, not 65%. So that's what an example where you'd be taking the what taking it away from 1. So if I were to do it in decimals it would be this.
okay? So if you want to decrease it by 35%, you would multiply it by 0 0.65, okay? That's like a discount of 35%, okay? And then to calculate T4, well, we know T, whoopsie, not A, T, A, T, it doesn't really matter. T1 is 120, so T2 would be uh, 0 0.65 times 120. which would be 78. T3 would be 70, wait, sorry, 0 0.65 times 78. And then T4 would be 0 0.65 times 50.7 which is 32.955. What do we think? Uh, so an, uh, a good question about the R, the common ratio being negative. Uh, no, you won't, I don't think you'll see a negative common ratio because, and so here's a little example. If I started with a, first term of 1 and then my r was say negative 2 well term 2 would become negative 2 and then term 3 would become because negative 2 times negative 2 would go back to positive and then term 4 would go back to negative and then term five would go back to positive. So when you multiply by a negative number, it's gonna start like fluctuating between positive and negative number. Uh, yeah, so basically um, multiplying by a number less than one is the same as dividing. Um, and yeah, you just gotta think of uh, 0 0.65 as being one, uh, if you started at one and took away 0 0.35, you ended up at 0 0.65, okay? Yeah, and so that's all you need it for. You only need it for working out how much the percentage decreases for. Or if you had a question that said something like, uh, create a recurrence relation that decreases each term by 20%, you would make the common ratio 0 0.8 because that's 20% off of 100. So that's the sort of question you might need it for. Okay. Uh, I just have one other question about um, 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 growth and decay. So I'll, I'll just address that one first and then I will on to these other questions. There's lots of good questions about uh, bivariate and stuff like that. But the question was, the third term is 16. And the ninth term is 88. What is the rule, basically? As in, what is what would be the recurrence relation? I, I reckon. Okay, so um, you could basically do this one kind of easily in your head if you think, well, there's six terms between three and nine. So. You'd basically be doing 88 minus 16 and then divide by 6. So the difference between those two terms and then divide by 6. So your common 
that would be your common difference. So your common difference is 12. And that kind of makes sense if you did 16 and then plus 12. So the fourth term would be 28, fifth would be 40, sixth would be 52, seventh would be 64, eighth would be 76, and ninth would be 88. So that's kind of, so your rule would then just be, And then you'd have, you'd have to work backwards to figure out what your term one is. Which is negative eight. You could do it like that. Um, you could also do that with simultaneous equations. So you could use the general rule. So T3 equals uh, T1 plus N minus 1D like that. But N is, hang on, N is uh, 3. Hang on, let me uh, leave that in there. And then that means it's 16. Like that. Which you can then get rid of the brackets very easily. Like that. So that would be one equation. And then your other equation would be 88 equals T1 plus 8D using the same kind of working out and then you could do equation oopsie equation two take away equation one so that would be 88 minus 16 equals t1 minus t1 plus 8D minus 2D, like that. So they'll become zero. And that's 6D. And then to solve, divide both sides by 6. And you get D equals 12, which is essentially what I did up here. But this is fancy. Okay, fancy maths, which we like. And then you would just write that rule. So, uh, if you actually, here's a fancy way of finding T1. like that and then we know that d is 12 so i'd substitute that in and then you would just take away 24 from both sides which works nicely. So your first term must be negative eight and your common difference must be 12. Okay. Hmm. I'll just see, I've seen that question about finding about one more recurrence relation question. Let me see what I can find real quick. And then we'll move on to one of the other topics. People have been very good waiting patiently for the other topics.
Uh, here's a good one. Classic. We always love one about tanks filled with water or swimming pools filled with water. Classic uh, recurrence one. Okay, so here we go. A swimming pool is filled with 200,000 litres of water. Under certain conditions, 2% of the water in the pool will evaporate each day. Determine the rule for the amount of water in the pool at the end of the nth day, uh, and then find the amount of water after the eighth day. Okay, so what I'll get you to do first think about is this growth or decay, and how would you know? Is it arithmetic or geometric? How would you know? And uh, I'll get you to write the recurrence relation first, and then we'll write the general rule for the nth term after that. So have a quick go of that. All right, so to answer some of those questions I posed before, uh, you know it's geometric because uh, it's decreasing by a percentage and not uh, a flat rate, okay? So it's definitely gonna be geometric. We also know it's decay because according to this, water is evaporating, which means the amount of water in the swimming pool will decrease. Decrease means decay. So it means our R value is going to be 1 minus 0 0.02, or if you prefer, 100% minus 2%, like that, okay? So your R value is going to be 0 0.98, like that. So that means that your recurrence relation is that, okay, with a starting value of that, okay? That's your recurrence relation. Now, uh, if you didn't use the letter A, the capital A, that's fine. If you use T as term or you used L for liters or anything like that would be fine, okay? Um, I'm just kind of in the habit of using A now. Okay, so the general rule for the nth term would then look like this. I remember now. So if you use T1 here, then make sure you use that formula. If you used zero instead of one, then your rule can just be
you don't need to do the takeaway one if you started at zero. But if you started at one, then you do need to take away one, okay? So two slightly different versions there, both are correct, okay? So that would mean that a n is going to be like that. And then if you wanted to know the eighth day, it would be to the power of eight like that, okay? But if you were doing The other one you'd have to use, this is the one I'm going to use though, because that makes the most sense to me. Because if you were using the first version, you'd have to call the eighth day the ninth term, which just is confusing to me. So I like using zero. That's what I got. Okay. So that's geometric decay, where you have to decrease by a percentage. You have to take that percentage away from one. All righty. The next question, one of the questions I got was about um, linear relationship, least squares, line, things like that. Okay. So here's a question where you were given some data. This was on the mock. And they asked you to draw on the scatter plot, which was quite nice and easy. Now, the next question, no, wait, this one here, C, determine a linear relationship for this data by fitting a least squares line. That does not mean go back to the graph and hand draw a line in, okay? That's not a very accurate way of doing it. So in the least squares line uh, question, if you see that word, least fit a least squares line, it means you have to use the formula. You've got some options. Some people like that one, but I think the one that they want you to use is that one, y equals a plus bx. Uh, yeah, just seeing the question about predicting data into the future for seasonal indices, it's actually done exactly the same way that you would extrapolate uh, bivariate data, which is what we're currently doing. So it's the same, exact same method, okay? Um, so now's a good time to tune in, okay? So, uh, so that's your equation of the line. So what you have to do is enter this data into the stat function of your calculator okay now in this question they've got the shoe size on the x axis and the height in the y axis so that means shoe size would be your x variable and height would be your y variable does everyone know how to enter it into their calculator can you let me know in the in the chat do i need to show you like physically with a calculator how to do that or do you know how to do it use the stat function on your calculator does anyone want me to show you physically with a calculator how to do that Okay, so it seems most people know how to at least enter that in. So I'll give you like a minute, uh, enter that data into your calculator, and then we will look up what those values are in our calculator.
Okay, so I've finished entering mine into my calculator. And if you're using the green calculator, like I'm using, remember they have um, the A and the B the wrong way around, okay? So the equation of this line would be Y equals 133.78 to two decimal places plus 5.47 to do two decimal places X. Now, sometimes they also want you to write in what the variables are. So you could also write height is equal to 133.78 plus times shoe size. Sometimes they want you to put the variables in there. So if you end up with some time at the end of the um, exam, then go ahead and do that. Uh, degrees and minutes into the calculator for earth geometry. That's a really good question. I will come back to that in just a second. Okay. So part D then asks you to extrapolate the adult shoe size for a person who is 1.7 meters tall. Okay. So that means if their height is 1.5 meters, you have to substitute that into the place of height. So that's 1.5 equals 133.78 plus 5.47x, and you need to solve for x. So your first step would to be to take 133.78 away from both sides. Wait, is that going to end up as a negative number? Hang on, I'm just checking that. Get my notebook out. Oh, I know what I've done wrong. Okay, got it. They're tri tricky centimeters, and that's meters. So let's fix that real quick. There we go. Now we're back on track. And then to solve for x, we would divide both sides by that. So x is 2.97, but you cannot have a shoe size of 2.97, so you would have to round that to size three. Okay, I wouldn't leave the answer as 2.97. That doesn't make any sense. It is not reasonable. And one of your assessment objectives is to evaluate the reasonableness of solutions. So if you put, if you don't do that, then you're probably not going to get full marks for that question. Uh, I had someone else, would it matter which way you do it? Um, I know there was at least one question where they accepted both ways around, um, but I wouldn't guarantee it. Usually, x, well, yeah, pretty much always, x is the explanatory variable. And y is the response variable. Okay, so X should be what causes the change in Y, 
Y responds to a change in X. X explains the variation in Y. Okay, so you would have to make sure that your X variable is explanatory and your Y variable is response. Uh, so what I'll get you to do in a minute is this question here. Okay, this was from paper two. So this is a complex question and I'll get you to do the same thing again. But I just had one question about this previous one here. Uh, where was it? How did I know to minus 100? Uh, and not just the initial one. Is that what the question was with the question from before? How do you know when to minus 100 from the weight ratio and not just the initial one? It's it's uh, the context of the question tells you whether it's growth or decay. Growth means numbers going up. Decay means numbers going down. In geometric sequences, if the R value is greater than 1, the numbers will go up and therefore growth. If the R value is less than one, the numbers will go down and therefore decay. So you're looking for key words that tell you whether it's growth or decay. If it's growth, you wanna add the percentage to one. If it's decay, you wanna take the number away from one. OK, so hopefully that clears things up a little bit. It is admittedly quite tricky to get your head around. Um, but fingers crossed, we can pick up some marks either way. Uh, is there any reason why the green calculator has it the other way around or do they just like confusing us? Uh, funnily enough, the equation of a straight line is one of those things that has a ton of variation in different places around the world. Um, so we write it in our way, but even if you go to Melbourne or Western Australia or Tasmania, they'll probably write it differently. Uh, you go to other parts in the world and they'll use different letters and symbols. So a lot of maths is standardized across the world, but for some reason, the equation of a straight line is just whatever the heck you feel like. And so it's actually quite common to have A and B the other way round, which is obviously the case where that calculator is manufactured. OK, so uh, they're not being mean. They just do it differently to the way we do it. And you've just happened to wander into the one area of maths that is not standardized across different regions. So, yeah, it's actually quite amazing. I'll, I'll put a next time I take my screen down, I'll find a little picture for you that I showed to one of my um, students the other day. All right. So that's enough gas bagging. I'll give everyone a chance to have a go at this question here. It's exactly the same sort of thing that we just did. So figure out what's your explanatory variable, what's your response variable, enter it into your calculator, come up with your equation, and then make a prediction by substituting the salary in. Give you a couple of minutes to do that. Uh, Olivia wants me to go back to the shoe question for a second. So maybe just take a quick screenshot or something like that if you're continuing to work on this question. But it is from the mock, I believe. So if you've got the mock handy, you'll have it there. Uh, there's the shoe question, Olivia. And there's the data for the shoe question. If you need it, grab a screenshot or something. I believe this one was in your mock as well. This was paper one though. All right, back to this question. I'll give you another minute to finish that one off. Okay, she's got it, lovely. Sorry, I think there's a bit of um, lag in the stream between 
like what I'm streaming and when I see your comments. So if it seems like I'm not looking at them, I am. It just there's a bit, little bit of lag. Okay, so I uh, entered the data into the uh, calculator with the salary being the X variable and the personal well-being index being the Y variable, because I would think in theory, the more money you make, the happier you are. I don't know what they're trying to tell us in this question, because we all know that money isn't necessarily happiness, but that's okay. Uh, so that would mean our equation is the PWI is determined by, I got 16.4 plus, I'm going to put this whole number in since it's terminating. But if you rounded it differently, that's probably fine as well. From what I've seen in the marking scheme, they kind of change it up a lot. They sort of don't seem to mind exactly how you round it as long as it's kind of logically consistent and as long as it meets convention. So, for example, if it's money, you definitely have to round two decimal places because that's convention for how we do money. And I got a personal well-being index of 95.4. Hopefully we all agree with that. Okay. Which seems pretty happy if it goes from zero to 100. Okay. So that process is exactly the same thing you do if you have uh, time series data. So if you have time series data, you have to de-seasonalize it or make sure it's de-seasonalized. Then you enter that data into the uh, uh, calculator as well. Um, you would just, for your X axis, you just number each data point, like one quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four, you know what I mean? So one, two, three, four, et cetera. Uh, and then come up with the equation exactly the way we just did. Uh, and that's that's it. Okay, so I think that was all of my requests so far. Oh, there was just one about degrees uh, into a calculator. So let's uh, let's practice uh, this one here minus this one here. Okay. Uh, so how do you put that in your calculator? Well, I'm going to describe it for you in words. So have your calculator in front of you. Uh, and if it's still not clear after I've done that, I'll figure out some way of turning my camera on and uh, trying to show you um, with my calculator here. Okay, so uh, I would type in, so it's 145 degrees and 22 minutes. Uh, so I would enter in 145, and then I press my second function button, which is the gray one in the top left-hand corner. There's then a button that says PRB, and above it says angle. Press that button. It brings up a bunch of options, and you should see number one has a degree symbol next to it. So press number one. We now need to enter in 22 minutes, so type 22. The second function button again, and then the angle slash PRB button, and you'll see option two has the minute symbol next to it, that little dash, so press two. You should now see your screen saying 145 degrees, 
22 minutes. Now you can subtract and we're going to enter in 145 degrees and five minutes. Sorry, 141 degrees and five minutes. So type in 141, second function angle, choose option one for degrees, and then press five, second function angle, pick option two for minutes. When you press enter, you get 4.283333333. That answer is not in degrees and minutes, which is not very helpful for you. So what you wanna do is convert it to degrees, minutes, and seconds. So once again, press second function and then the angle button. If you look down the list, you'll see that option six has arrow DMS. That means convert to degrees, minutes, seconds. So choose option six and then press enter and you should get four degrees and 17 minutes. Hopefully you were able to follow along with that with your calculators, but let me know. Um, if you really don't know what I'm talking about, I'll show you on my camera. In the meantime, I've had some requests for time zones. So I'm going to quickly get some questions together and we'll have a look at some time zones. All right, got one easy one, one hard one. That'll do the trick. All right, calculator issues sorted. That's great. Uh, found that diagram I wanted to show you. So this is just a list of of some of the variations of the straight line formula across the globe. As you can see, there are a lot of them. So you can see even in Australia, sometimes we call the variable on its own B, which is probably why your calculator does that. OK, so you can see this is the one where it's the other way around, which is probably means that the calculator was manufactured in one of those countries, which is why it's the other way around to what we're doing. I personally like the Greek one with the Greek letters. That's cool. OK, so, yeah, just one of those weird things. All right, let's have a look at this question here. Uh, I'm not going to do A for now in case people are super interested in me doing that, but I believe I did do some, I did some distances on great and small circles last night. The recording of that is up on the channel, so you can go back. I think it was right towards the end. It would have been the last 30 minutes. I'll try and get back, um, get back in and put in the timestamps. I often put the timestamps in the description. 
um, but for now it should be sort of the last half hour of the video I did distances. So I'm just going to do time zones for now. So here's our two places. We want to figure out the day and time to the nearest hour. It will be in Dead Horse when it is 10 a.m. in Tixie on a Monday. Okay, so the first thing I always do is I always draw a diagram with these things. So my diagram looks a little something like this, with the middle being zero, both zero degrees longitude and zero time zones, because that is uh, UTC slash GMT, but UTC is the official one, okay? And then over here will be everything in the Eastern Hemisphere, and over here will be everything in the Western Hemisphere, okay? So you can see Dead Horse in Alaska is about here at 148 degrees west, and then uh, Tixi in Russia is about, 128 degrees east, like that, okay? So this is, and this is Tixie. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but it's how I'm doing it, okay? So um, first thing we need to do is find the uh, distance, uh, the angular distance between them in terms of longitude. Because time is is changes as the longitude changes, not as the latitude changes. Okay, because uh, if you think about it, say uh, New Zealand is like three hours ahead of us, but say Japan, which is much further away from us, is almost on the same time zone as us, even though it's much further away. But because it's directly north of us it's almost on the same time zone, okay? So things that are a different longitude have a different time zone, not a different latitude, okay? So we need the angular distance between these two, so we need to add them. So that would be 148 plus 128, which is going to be... 276 degrees. Uh, now, in part A, um, you would do the 360 take away 276 thing. Um, that's because in terms of distance, you don't want to go the long way round. But unfortunately, with time, you have to go the long way round because time only moves in one direction, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'm sure some of you would like to go back a few months and study some more, no doubt. Uh, so we have to go the long way. We have to use the bigger angle. Okay. So uh, now the time difference is going to be 276 degrees divided by 15. Now, do we know why it's divided by 15? Um, if you don't, I'll explain in just a second. Okay, 15, we divide by 15. If you think about it, on the globe, it's uh, a full circle. So the globe turns one full circle in one day, okay? So one full rotation is 360 degrees, yes? Now we call one full rotation one day, and we also attribute 24 hours to one day. So if you do 360 divided by 24, 24 hours in one day, that gives you how many degrees in one hour. So that means 15 degrees is equal to one hour, okay? 
So if I have 276 degrees uh, and divide by 15, that'll tell me how many hours, okay? So it, you might prefer to just remember that, okay? But if you forget, you can always think, well, it's 360 degrees in one rotation and there's 24 hours in a day. 360 divided by 24 is 15, okay? So we know that the time difference is 18 hours, okay? And we wanna know the time in dead horse. So this is what we're trying to figure out. When it is 10 a.m. Monday. Okay, and this is where my diagram can come in handy because I can see very clearly in my diagram that Tixie is ahead of dead horse. The sun rises in the east, okay, and sets in the west, okay? So Tixie is going to be ahead of dead horse. So if I want to convert to dead horse time, I'm going to have to take away 18 hours. All right, have a go at that. All right, so the answer to that is therefore 4 p.m. on Sunday. How did we go? Oh, so I had a question about rounding. So why did I round to the nearest answer? Uh, sorry, to the nearest hour. Uh, I did that because the question actually says to the nearest hour. So that's why I didn't put in the 24 minutes, okay? Now, time zones are very helpfully often rounded to the nearest hour, okay? So, for example, uh, Queensland's a big state. Uh, over here in Brisbane, it's probably not exactly according to the sun the same time as it is further out towards somewhere like, I don't know, Mount Isa or Longreach or somewhere further inland, okay? But because we're all one state, we kind of round the, the time zone to the nearest hour, okay? Otherwise, it would be too tricky to figure out the time. Um, so pretty much every time zone in the world is rounded to the nearest hour. I think there's two exceptions. I think Nepal is one of them, is like to the nearest quarter hour or something like that. And I think there's one other in that region that goes to the nearest half hour or something like that but that would be pretty mean if they gave you that without any additional information. So you can probably assume if you're doing this question that you round it to the nearest hour and to make sure you read the instructions on the question carefully, okay? Because it does actually specify that you have to round to the nearest hour, okay? All right, let's give this one a go. This one is complex. So let's see how you go with that. Okay, definitely start by drawing yourself a diagram. That's what I always do.
Uh, yes, Abby, I've seen your comment about uh, the question you're having trouble with. Uh, yeah, if you want to uh, uh, post it, are you part of that Facebook page? Is that where you found me? If so, you can post it in the comment there for today's live stream. Uh, or my, I think, is my email address attached to uh, my this uh, YouTube account? I hope so. If not, let me know and I will uh, tell you what the email address is. Okay, I'm going to start drawing my diagram for this one. All right, there's my diagram. All right, so the time difference between uh, Sydney and Johannesburg is going to be 10 take away two. That's why they call it time difference, because you take away. So it's eight hours times different time difference in Sydney oops, is ahead of Joburg, okay? So what we can do is we can figure out Sarah's departure time 
in Joburg time. Would then be uh, 6.15 a.m. Saturday. Uh, and we would have to, uh, first of all, uh, take away eight hours because it's behind. And that means that it is uh, 10.15 p.m. on Friday. When it's 10.15 p.m. on Friday in Johannesburg, when Sarah departs, okay? So therefore the arrival time would be Joburg time plus the flight time, which is 14 hours and 18 minutes. So you add that and you get an arrival time of 12.33 p.m. on Saturday. Okay, so that's in Johannesburg time when she arrives. So therefore, we know that Marcus arrives at the same time, okay? So if Marcus arrives at... 12.33 p.m. Saturday, we can now work backwards, okay? So if, if he arrived at 12.33 p.m. Uh, and the flight took 18 hours and 15 minutes, if we work backwards, we can figure out his departure time, but we would then need to convert that to Lima local time, okay? So let's do that. All right, total light. Why did I add the flight time? Uh, because uh, flying takes time. Um, <laughs> so she, if she left, what I did was I took Saturday 6.15 a.m. And first of all, I converted that to, to Johannesburg time, okay? Uh, and then I added the flight time. I could have done it the other way around. I could have started with 6.15 a.m. on Saturday and then added the flight time and then converted it to Johannesburg time, okay? Uh, but essentially, I added the flight time because flying is adding time. It takes time to, to fly, so I need to add that. I'm taking it away from Marcus's because I'm working backwards in Marcus's case. Okay, I know his arrival time and I'm trying to figure out his departure time. So that's why I'm taking his away instead of adding. So that means his uh, departure time in Joburg time is 6.18 p.m. on Friday. And then his uh, his uh, local time in Lima time would be to take away seven hours because uh, the time difference between Johannesburg and Lima would be seven hours because it would be uh, two take away negative five, which turns into two plus five, which is seven.
and I need to take it away because Lima is behind Johannesburg. See why the diagram can help keep things in order? So the answer is uh, eight, uh, sorry, 11, 18 a.m. Friday, okay? Uh, make sure you say the day as well, okay? A lot of people leave that off, but you do get a mark for that as well. Okay, just gonna see if I can find that question from Abby. Give me one second. Uh, if you've got any more requests, uh, pop them in the chat now. Uh, modifying loans, oh, put it on the Facebook, yeah, put it on the Facebook post, Abby, and then I'll take a look. Um, Jack, I can see you're a question about modifying loans. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. I haven't heard that modifying loans phrase before. Can you give me an example of what you mean or send me a question or something like that? Have I, have I missed anyone's requests? If I have, remind me in the chat. I'm sort of looking through to make sure I've covered everything. Remember, I did do some uh, questions yesterday as well, and that uh, recording is on the channel, so you can go back and have a look through that. Uh, we did Prem's algorithm. We did, uh, we did some drawing uh, critical path networks with dummy activities. We did flow networks and we did some earth geometry from memory. Oh, we did a Hungarian algorithm as well. So if there's any of those, it's chapter 7.07 in my textbook. What, which textbook are you using? Is that Nelson or Pearson? I have Nelson, Pearson and Cambridge. I don't have Jacaranda though. Okay, I've got Abby's question now. Yep, got it here, Abby. Let me just post it so everyone can see. Uh, Nelson. Okay, I'll take a look at that in a second, uh, Jack. I'm just going to do Abby's question first, and then I'll look up that reference in the textbook that you mentioned, see what I can find. There's been certainly been some shenanigans with these different textbooks. They do, they can't quite seem to agree with each other, which is a little annoying. Okay, let's have a look at this. And the accountant for a small gift shop is analyzing the sales to try and forecast sales for the next few years. She has produced a list of actual sales and deseasonalized sales for 2018 and 2019. Uh, the least squares regression line has been fitted and is given by Dada, where X is the time code and Y is the deseasonalized sale. The correlation coefficient is 0 0.84. That seems too easy. Okay. 
let me let me just draw a little table here because this is how I think about it. I would do I wonder why it's worth three marks though. Yeah. Do you have the hopefully you have the solutions there so you can tell me if I'm doing the right thing. So what I'm just going to do is write in the date code. So the date code it, for this one is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And they want it for the fourth quarter of 2021, which would be 16. So I just kept the date code going if that makes sense just continued pattern so then if i wanted to know the oh i can i i just saw why it's worth three marks because it wants the actual sales not the dc's not i got it now because why is the de-seasonalized So all I've done is substitute 16 into the place of X. And I'm going to figure out what that is first. That'll give us our de-seasonalized. Yes, I can see the shenanigans is that they haven't given us the seasonal indices and they want the actual sales. So we're going to have to figure out the seasonal index that they've used. Fun for everyone. Okay, so I got Okay. That's cool. Now we need to figure out our seasonal index. Is that the formula you guys are using to figure out the de-seasonalized? It would be the actual value divided by the seasonal index. We did cover this briefly in yesterday's live stream, I believe. Oh, look, we did so much yesterday. There it is. Yeah. Lovely. So in that case, if we wanted the seasonal, so let's just take, I'm just going to take uh, quarter four of 2018. The deseasonalized figure was 27045. And the actual, so I'm looking at that and that. Uh, was 37450 divided by the seasonal index. But I want the seasonal index. So I'm going to do a switch. So the seasonal index would be I'm using quarter four because my um, predicted value is the fourth quarter as well. So I'm just trying to use the same uh, quarters data. I'm going to round that to two decimal places and hope for the best. So that's what I get for the seasonal index there. Now, I'm just going to check this. So I'm going to do the same process to these two uh, just to see if they give me the same 
seasonal index. If they don't, that will be interesting. Hey, it's the same. Hooray. Happy, happy, happy. So that's definitely our seasonal index there. As I said, I've rounded it to two decimal places. Um, I don't know if that's okay in this marking scheme, but from what I've seen from the QCAA, they don't mind so much. Okay, so that means, so that's my seasonal index. So if the D seasoned is the actual over the seasonal index, and we know the deseasonalized amount is that. We want the actual, and the seasonal index is 1.38. So that means I have to multiply. So the actual, I'm just rearranging algebraically, is going to be 1.38 times. Rearranging equations is a handy tool because it means you only have to remember one formula and not every iteration of it. Um, since I've still got the figure in my calculator, I'm just going to use it and see what the difference is. I get... That would be the most accurate answer, but if you've rounded it, you will get this. Um, but this one would be more accurate because what I did is I just kept that big long value in my calculator and carried it down. Okay. So, um, Abby, let me know if you've been given the solutions to that question and if you can tell me what they say the answer is. And hopefully I got it right. Fingers crossed. Uh, okay, I'm just going to look for Jack's question real quick. And then I've also seen a request for max flow min cut. Uh, we did do that last live stream. So if we don't get to it, uh, it is on that recording. Oh, hooray, I got the right answer. That's always nice. All righty, I'm looking at modifying loans. Oh. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, I can see why this was confusing you, Jack. <laughs> okay. What is going on? Okay. Um, I don't know if this is comforting at all, Jack, but I have not seen anything like that on the QCAA samples at all. Uh, so 
I, I think I have noticed because I've looked at a couple of different textbooks and I've noticed some of them just like to kind of throw in stuff that they think might be important because you have to remember they were writing these textbooks before any of the uh, sample assessment came out and some of those syllabus dot points are really vague okay so they're really open to interpretation um so hmm i to be honest the day before the exam that would not be my priority because i don't think it's that important i would focus more on the annuity stuff and the recurrence stuff so I made a video, it's on this channel, all about annuities. I put some practice questions in there and then I go through the answers. So if you're still worried, I'd go through that video there. But that particular chapter, that just looks like some random stuff. If it does turn up on the exam, it'll be a complete fluke. So I would not be making that my priority right now. Uh, multiplying matrices, I can definitely do that. Um, Hungarian algorithm I did yesterday. So if you, if I don't get time, and I might cap this at nine because uh, I need to get some sleep, and so do you all. Um, I'll do the multiplying matrices now, and then um, I will uh, let you go watch the Hungarian algorithm video from last night. Okay, uh, let me just get up a matrix to multiply. Why don't we steal that one from the uh, from the mock that sent everyone into a panic? Always a good sign. Uh, da, da, da. Where is it? Ah, there's the culprit. All right, here's the one. I've cut out a bunch of the question. I've just got the diagram there because I know this question back to front because it's one of my most common requests from my students. All right, so the first thing we have to do is draw the adjacency matrix, okay? Oops, that's, nope. get the one stage pathway. So there's zero from D to D, there's one from D to E, there's, oh, lost everything, here we go. Uh, there is, what was I up to? Uh, one from D to F, uh, from E to D, there's one. From E to E, there's none. From E to F, there's two. From F to D, there's one. There's E to F is two, and there's zero from F to F. So that's our matrix for one stage pathways. And let's call that matrix A. Well, one stage pathways, one stage, not one step. There we go. To find two stage pathways, you have to square the one stage pathways, okay? So that means multiply matrix A by matrix A, okay? Now, 
<clears throat> I I do matrix multiplication a little bit differently. Uh, I found a uh, a TED talk when I was researching this uh, a while ago, and they do it this way. I want to say the guy's name is Shilto or something like that. But if you just Google TED talk matrix multiplication or matrices, you'll find the one I'm talking about. Um, so what he does is he sets it up like a table. So Does that kind of make sense? So it's kind of one matrix multiplied by the other in sort of this array, if that makes sense. I'm just going to, I'm actually just going to space it out a little bit more. I haven't given myself enough room to write. Okay, so I'm just going to draw my sort of grid lines up here. So it kind of makes a table like this. Stay with me. Okay, so what I have to do, let me just get a highlighter real quick. So what I need to do is multiply this number by this number in this square here, if that makes sense. Then this number by this number, and then this number by this number. Oops. Oh, go back, go back, go back. Okay. So for the yellow, zero times zero is zero. For the green, one times one is one. And for the purple, one times one is one. And that gives me a total of two. Okay. For the next square, So for this square here, I would need that times that, that times that, and that times that. So for the yellows, zero times one is zero. For the greens, one times zero is zero. And for the purples, one times two is two. Gives me a total of two. Okay. Hopefully this is kind of keeping sense. I'm going to stop doing the highlighting thing. Uh, but for the next square, it would be 0 times 1 is 0. 1 times 2 is 2. 1 times 0 is 0. In the next row, um, okay, maybe I'll do the coloring thing one more time. So I'm going to do this square here, which means I would need to do that times that, that times that, and that times that. So it's going to be 0, 0, 2. The next one's going to be 1, 0, 4. The next one's going to be one, zero, zero. The next one's going to be zero, two, zero. The next one's going to be one, zero, zero. And the last one's going to be one, four. 
zero. And so a squared is two, 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 five, one, two, and five. Like that. That's how I square a matrix. I know lots of other teachers do like a run and dive thing, like you look across and then you look down or something like that. But putting it in a table like that just makes so much more sense to me. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions about that. I think the question asks for, from memory, it wants the, the one and two stage. pathways. So if you want both, that would be the one stage plus the two stage. So you'd have to do which is a lot easier because you just need to go zero plus two is two, one plus two is three, one plus two is three, three, five, three, 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 five. So that's your one and two stage. So that's how you do that particular question. All right, so it's just hit nine o'clock. So uh, I'm going to call it there. Um, just a quick question before I go. Uh, do you think, are people interested in doing this again tomorrow night? I know you would have done paper one by then, but just gauging interest. Do people want to do it uh, tomorrow night as well? I don't think I have as much availability though. I think I've got some things on that night, but I might be able to squeeze something in. Just want to see interest. Some people are still interested. Okay. Okay. Um, I will see what I can do. It might be at a different time though. Uh, so uh, just keep an eye out either on that Facebook page or uh, if you hit subscribe and uh, you know, get accept the notifications, you'll see when I live stream. So I'll try and fit it in somewhere. Um, but yeah, I'll just have to figure out exactly when because I do have a couple of things on. So just keep an eye out. Uh, either way, I will post the uh, recording on there. So uh, even if you do miss it, you can watch it at another time. Uh, so good luck to everyone tomorrow. Um, I hope it goes really well for you and that there's nothing too strange on there. Uh, the paper that you're doing tomorrow afternoon should be simple, familiar questions. So with any luck, it'll be fairly straightforward. Uh, and then the Friday morning one is the one it will be the nightmare. Uh, oh, you're welcome. I can see all your thank yous there. So uh, no, you're very welcome. Um, yeah, I'm happy to happy to do this and sort of share some knowledge there. Um, you guys have had a pretty uh, raw deal this year, so I figured I'd try and help out as much as I could. Um, but yeah, spread the word. If you have any um, younger siblings that end up doing general maths next year, I might try and do it again for them. Um, but yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> Favorite YouTuber. Oh, <laughs> that's weird to think of. All right. Well, good luck, everyone. Get a really good night's sleep. Don't stay up too late studying. Um, make sure you've got a fresh mind and a full belly tomorrow before you go into the exam, okay? All right. Okay, good luck, everyone. Uh, see you tomorrow night then. <laughs> uh, thanks for the, the note about the ad money there, but uh, I, I think you have to have a lot more... Uh, <laughs> Uh, action than uh, um, subscribers that I've got to get actual money. So <laughs> uh, that's certainly not why I'm doing it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Good luck, everyone. Good